Guys, welcome to the Calling Your Shot podcast. I'm pumped. I actually decided to do Hunter as our first episode of the podcast. I'm excited. Um, one thing I wanted to start with, especially since you're a man in faith, I wanted to say a prayer real quick. Because Absolutely. I think he's the one that led me to this point, and I'm excited for this. So I uh-huh. just want to start off with a good quick prayer, okay? Um, Lord, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, giving me this vision to do these things. Um, I thank you for putting Hunter in my place because I know that he has a really good story and he could potentially help a couple of veterans out there that need some help. So thank you, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this great studio, and I appreciate everything you've done for me, and I'm leaving it all in your hands to hopefully become successful. Amen. Awesome. I'm excited. Hunter, it's um, a pleasure to have you here. I'm super excited to have you on the show. I think your story is is great. In fact, the fact that you haven't come on other shows and actually started talking about this is uh, is mind boggling to me because what you're doing is huge. So I guess let's get the uh, listeners a little bit of uh, your background. Let's start off with a little bit about yourself. Can you go? I, I yeah. could say it, but I want you to say it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much for having me on. It's, you know, my, my life has been quite the journey from childhood to where I'm at now. I've, I've gotten to to do a lot of things and I've I've got to see a lot of things and I've had some incredible journeys and some very terrible journeys um, along this route of life um, but I wouldn't trade it for the world uh, my 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 story is kind of the typical military brat I was born on 29 Palms California Marine Corps place. base what yeah a place. <laughs> so it's you know the most beautiful Marine Corps base there is on the planet and uh, you know, I, I didn't spend too much time there. I was three months old when um, my family decided to move. My dad got out of the Marine Corps on active duty side, joined the reserves, and uh, we moved back to Louisiana where he was originally from. So when he joined the Marine Corps, he was living in Louisiana, shipped out to California. And then after his four years, he moved back to Louisiana. So I, th- I think it, it's interesting you say that because when you when you put it in that perspective, you talk about how he got out of the active duty component. Yeah. You think he's going to the reserves. And I mean, from knowing your dad's story a little bit, you think, oh, okay, now now I get my dad. But it's quite the opposite, right? From yeah. What it sounds like. <laughs> so yeah. So, how were your younger years like? You know, obviously, you 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 have a good family. I've seen your guys' yeah. posts and stuff. You guys look like you have a blast out there. You guys are followers in Christ and and all that good stuff. But how were your early life? Your early life as a kid? Yeah. So um, after we moved from uh, California back to Louisiana. <laughs> That was like the the start of my childhood, right? My brothers and sisters, uh, my sister was born, and then my brother was born at this time. My dad was um, a cop for St. Charles Parish, which is uh, basically borders New Orleans Parish. And uh, it's not the greatest area right now, but back in the day, back when my dad was growing up and back when um, I was there, it was full of uh, fishermen, you know, guys that were in the oil industry. So it was a pretty safe area. Um, my dad would stick with that job for a few years while my mom was being a stay-at-home mom, and my dad was trying to make ends meet for us. We weren't very well off. We were, I know my dad was having to work um, a lot of overtime, and I know he was having to work extra jobs. Um, one of his extra jobs was professional fighting. So he would go out and fight on the weekends, and then the next day he'd be back in uniform on the streets chasing down bad guys. Hopefully not with a black guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, so um, a lot of a lot of hard hardship on my parents to keep our our family afloat. Yeah, and they did an amazing job at providing food on the table for us at that young of an age. Um, my first childhood trauma happened when I was four years old uh, to six and this would be something that would follow me for a really long time in life it and I I don't want to say it haunted me because I give that um, tragedy power over my life when I say that but it definitely put a stain on on my soul uh, that wouldn't be washed away uh, till 2014 so um, I had a babysitter um, that would watch me while my dad would go um, work and my mom would go clean houses to bring in some extra cash. That babysitter, who was a female, would molest me multiple times throughout um, this time period. And that really 
you know, having my own children now, a daughter that is four years old, I couldn't imagine four-year-old Hunter going through the things that I was going through Correct. when I'm looking at my daughter. So um, this would go on for some time, and I didn't know how to tell my parents. And I, and I'm 27 years old now, and I still remember this clearly. These times that it would happen, and uh, I. I didn't know how to tell my parents. I didn't know how to say, hey, my babysitter's making me touch her in certain ways, or she's touching me in certain ways. I didn't know how to bring that up to my parents without it making it seem like I was telling them a lie or me feeling like I was, uh, you know, weird for saying this yeah. type of stuff. And so- um, I mean, I you're a kid. You still don't understand the whole yeah, thought I, process of it. In your absolutely. Opinion. I didn't know what sex was. Um, I knew that I walked in on my parents when I was like, four and a half, five years old. So I knew that that's how babies were made, but I didn't yeah. quite understand that what the intimacy of that actually is. And so that, that kind of put a stain on my life that I wouldn't realize till I was in fourth grade. So we'll fast forward a little bit. So um, we're in Louisiana, 9-11 happens. Um, my dad automatically goes back onto active duty um, and or he, he tries to go back onto active duty to get activated to deploy because my dad was like i want to go so i remember my dad like basically ready to go to war as soon as those towers came down he ended up going to uh, the federal air marshals we moved to denver colorado and that's where i got into wrestling so i started wrestling at this really young age and it followed me to this day i still wrestle or do jujitsu but i incorporate my wrestling into yeah. that's my base and uh that was something that would I would use as a crutch, something that I would use as a way to medicate myself from uh, my babysitter molesting me. Yeah. And so uh, my dad would eventually get a job um, working for the DoD, and he he got based out of Texas, and we uh, moved out here, and he started his job. That was in 2004. Yeah. And he was gone from 2004 to 2009, pretty much the entire time. And when my dad left, uh, my dad made it very clear that I was the man of the house, that he was going off to war and that I needed to watch over my mom, my brother, and my sister. This time I'm like seven or eight years old. Yeah. And she's so, like, oh, man, what are, yeah, I'm pretty, what are you talking about? Pretty young. Yeah. My dad always groomed me yeah. to be someone that was like more mature than, than my peers. Like I was not... I was not the same as the kids that grew up on my street. Yeah. I did not go um, play video games. I did not watch cartoons. I didn't watch SpongeBob and all this stuff. Yeah. Like I was watching Modern Marvels, History Channel. Yeah. Um, I was going out in the woods trying to kill things, like the typical like, you know, Texas man yeah. that I had envisioned the cowboy yeah. in my head. Like I was like, I want to be like that. Yeah. And so my dad laid this basically path out for me of saying, hey. I don't care how old you are, you're going to be the man of this household. And if someone tries to come in this household, you're going to protect your family to the death. Yeah. That was the type of mentality we had. My dad, one of, the, one of the really special things my dad and I did before he left was we got a branch in our backyard. So the Spartans, when they would go to battle, their oldest son would get an olive branch. The son and the father would break this stick apart. The father would take it into battle. The son would keep it somewhere in the house. Uh, that was special to him. And so every time my dad would go on these deployments, he would have his branch, I would have mine. And, um, you know, if he ever died, that branch wouldn't come back to be connected. So you'd break it in half, and then when he gets home, you put it back together. Um, that was a type of, like, relationship my dad and I had. It was very close. It was very different than the father and son relationships of the families on my street. Yeah. And uh, I mean, even nowadays, even uh, nowadays, yeah. yeah, you wouldn't see that stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's huge. So we we were very close. You know, my dad and I are still best friends to this day, um, but we've we've always been like that. We've always been extremely close. And uh, being so close to him hurt me every time he would go on a deployment. And I was happy that he would go on a deployment because I knew he was rescuing people, he was saving people, he was fighting for the freedom of America and hunting yeah. down um, these evil human beings. 
I knew that that was his mission. My dad probably shouldn't have told me some of the stuff he did, but he did, and um, because I pushed it out of him, you know, I'm the annoying son in the car ride for yeah with him from Houston to Dallas for like five hours yeah. just talking his ear off trying to get stuff out. Um, but uh, you know, our relationship was so strong that every time he would leave, it felt like I was losing a piece of me when he would go. Yeah, and it eventually built up to me having some resentment towards my dad because I felt like for all those years that he was gone, I was losing very valuable time with him and I was losing valuable time out of my childhood because I was having to be such a, a grown up yeah. at seven to 11 years old. So that, now that you're adult and you have your, your, your girls, right? You got two girls, right? Mm -hmm. um, now that you have your girls and that resentment you had and everything to your dad, like do you now feel like that has changed because of what kind of man you are today with your family? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I see, I, I see what he was doing, and I see that he wasn't doing those things to um, try to make me feel bad. He was doing those things because that was number one yeah. his job, and number two, he was he had a calling. Yeah, for that. Yeah, and I, I guess I understand that because I had an absent dad too, and not because he was out being a bad person or anything. It was because he genuinely is working his butt off to provide yeah. for the family. And for the longest time, like I'm the first one to get out of my household by not going to jail or anything. And yeah. it was just, it was huge for me, huge to do that for my mom and my dad. But at one point I was like, this isn't for any of you guys. Like, you know, like this is for myself because I wanted to do this. I had this resentment towards them. And it wasn't until later on that now I work and I have my own family, my own house and you know, my own bills and stuff like that, that I realized, man, that actually molded me in the right direction because I now understand why he was gone, why he was yeah. out of town all the time, why he was never really always, he never showed me how to change a tire. And so a lot of the stuff that I did was self-taught. I learned how to shoot a gun in the Marine Corps, right? So mm -hmm. it was, none of that stuff was taught to me. And I was like, man, what kind of dad is he that he didn't teach me anything, but he did teach me one thing. And that was to do whatever you gotta do to provide for your family, right? Yeah. And as much, it was a Hispanic, you know, household not a lot of money you know we weren't rich or anything and you know he made his mistake early on in life and came back from it and I had that resentment and now that I'm older I'm like no I don't have resentment like he he taught me how not I want how I did not want to live my life mm -hmm. right so that's why I was curious how you felt now later that you've got your life going yeah and everything. yeah definitely didn't want to make my my daughter or my child at the growing up I was like I don't want to have my children feel like their dad is having to leave them and they're building a resentment yeah. towards them. So when my dad came home from his from his last deployment, things were like really, really bad. You know, like yeah. he, he hit rock bottom. He was a completely different person. I'm in the process of writing a book right now of my own and uh, just got done with a chapter a few months ago on this specific time period of when my dad got home from his final deployment um, and transitioning into this new life, um, I would find my dad in our backyard um, in a pool chair sitting on the edge of our pool, like literally looking just out into the distance with like no expression on his face. That dad that I had that left in 2004 was a completely different man that came back in 2009. Yeah. And it really wrecked me because I was like, man, my best friend's gone. Like he's not here anymore. Like that, that daddy that I wanted like that dad is now like a Somewhere. completely different yeah. person. And that, that really affected me. And so this was around fourth grade. Uh, I had a friend, obviously, you know, young boys start going through puberty and start, you know, you find out the birds and the bees and find out all these things and, and pornography was a big thing at this yeah. time or still is. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was introduced to porn and uh, at the time, I, I had no idea what porn was, and then my buddy brought me over to his house, and he was like, hey, check this out, and his little, um, what is it, the eye touch is what they were, yeah, like yeah. the, the touchscreen. Uh, yeah, the, the um, cool iPhone, or iPod at the time. iPod, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, of course, this thing's freaking hooked up to Wi-Fi. Yeah. And so, started watching porn on one of those things, and, and it destroyed me, because I was a fourth grade boy watching yeah. porn, to try to cope with um, my dad being gone, um, my dad not coming home mentally, 
And then what happened to me? You just distracted in Louisiana. Yeah. It distracted me enough uh, to to take my eyes off of you know the right path. Yeah. I was raised in a home that had Christian principles and values, but I wasn't raised in a home that had a solid core belief and a solid foundation on yeah. Christ. And uh, that set me up for, for failure. Yeah. And so that is why I coped with these certain things. Now, I knew that it wasn't healthy, so I tried to cope. I tried to, like... Uh, attack it from a different angle and and start doing wrestling and start doing jujitsu um but then i would get bored of that and then i go back to porn yeah it was like it was a never-ending cycle yeah. and so um at this time my dad opened a gym in uh the woodlands it was called gracie baja the woodlands it was very popular a lot of uh the original like houston og fighters would come in and out of our gym mick Maynard, he's the uh a ufc matchmaker yeah. now and he was a Muay Thai instructor for our gym. And Alex Morano, Ricky Torsios, um, obviously my dad. Yeah. Um, a lot of really good athletes came from, from this crop. So I, I was like heavily invested into the, to the martial arts community around Houston when it was in the beginning stages in this area. And uh, I would tag along with my dad on all this stuff. Yeah. So my dad opened the gym. My dad starts fighting professionally again. Our team has professional fighters. We start traveling around the country and um, I just tagged along with my dad for all of this. Yeah. And I felt like I was starting to get into a rhythm where my dad was coming back. Yeah. Um, but at this time, my dad wasn't living a healthy life. My dad was uh, very verbally abusive uh, to my family and he was not loyal and faithful to my mom and he was destroying our family piece by piece and I don't think he realized that he was um, but well, over time it was taking a toll yeah it was yeah. taking a toll and uh, so we uh, well a funny story we were in Louisiana Shreveport Louisiana and uh, I forgot how old I was at this time I think this was in 2009 or 10 um, our, I had a buddy of mine. We called him Mick Steve. Um, Mick Steve worked at a McDonald's. He was a manager there. <laughs> he was in the Army National Guard. And uh, Mick Steve got fired from McDonald's for putting some racist sticky note on the cash register because this this lady was messing with him, so he decided to mess with her. Yeah. And uh, he ended up getting fired for it. Funny, funny story. But Mick Steve... Um, McSteve was fighting this weekend in Shreveport, and uh, so was another guy, Alex Morano. And we go to the weigh-ins, and after the weigh-ins, we go to IHOP. You know, these guys are 21, 23 yeah. years old, and they're like, I just want to put on a bunch of weight yeah. and eat bad. And so we went to IHOP, and uh, I cannot, this story, I cannot believe I'm about to tell this, but um, we, were, we got done eating at IHOP, and we had another guy with us. His name was Zoolander. Zoolander, we all make fun of him because he had beauty through pain tattooed on his ribs. Like, there's just this crazy bunch of dudes. Yeah. And then my dad. And uh, they all order this food to go. And I'm like, why the heck are they ordering food to go? Well, we leave and uh, we get onto the highway and they start throwing these food out the windows. So on the highway, we're driving, well, it felt like 80 miles an hour. We're having a food fight mid, oh mid drive on this highway. And uh, you, we get to the hotel parking lot, and uh, Alex parks his truck. McSteve comes behind him, basically broadside behind his truck. And uh, McSteve gets out and says, don't hit my car, guys. And these, these words will never leave my head. Like his little nerdy voice, don't hit my car, guys, pops his head out the window and says that. <laughs> Someone throws a burrito at Alex's truck. Alex throws it in reverse spins the wheels t-bones makes steve's car totals it oh he was gosh. so upset so that was the morning that was just the morning like all that happened that morning well then a few hours later they had to go to these fights well my dad's mind was moving so fast at this time all he could think about was like the next thing yeah he forgot about me so i get at this time we didn't have cell phones <laughs> like i'm like trying to figure out like how i'm gonna meet up with my dad my dad leaves 
and I'm like, everybody's gone. Like all all the team is gone. How am I, how the heck am I gonna get to where we're going? Yeah. Like, does my dad even know where I am? So I go down to the front lobby and I ask this lady if I can use her phone to call my dad. And uh, so I call my dad on her phone, and she's telling me not to use all of her prepaid minutes on her on her flip phone. <laughs> the good and old prepaid minutes. Yeah, yeah. So um, my dad sends this guy. His nickname is Dead Man. I don't even know if the dude's alive anymore. <laughs> This guy was hopefully crazy. Hopefully he didn't live up to his yeah, name. Yeah, hopefully right? he didn't live up to his name. But this guy that my dad sent to get me had a tat had his tattoo from the bottom of his neck all the way down to his belly button of stitches. Like he got an autopsy done. Oh. And this guy's crazy. Yeah. Picks me up and we're going like 120 miles an hour down like a side street in my parents' forerunner. And I'm like, my dad's gonna be so mad if we get in an accident yeah. and something happens. But these are the types of funny stories that I, I was experiencing like on a monthly basis. Yeah. And I was using that to suppress these emotions that I had of, of feeling like my dad was gone. Yeah. Of, of all the hurt that it's I had. a lot of distraction. A lot of distraction. Not probably the best distraction. Not right? the best yeah. distractions. Um, but I felt like there was so much more to my life that I, that I haven't lived up to. But uh, fast forward a few years uh, through my dad's story, through my, through my parent or my family's story, my dad in, has a, a miraculous change in his life. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Completely turns our family around. At this right, right before this, my family was completely shattered. Um, my parents were on the verge of divorce. My parents were living in two separate places. My dad was having affairs with multiple women. It was like the worst of the worst that you could possibly imagine. Uh, my dad finds Christ and completely changes the aspect of our family. Within three months, he starts what is called Mighty Oaks Foundation. Mighty Oaks was basically an idea that my, ha my dad had to start something to help veterans uh, struggling like himself. So this happened in August. We officially started in uh, October. And December 11, 2000, 2011, we moved to a little town in Colorado called Westcliff. And this is where really the transition, the tra the basically this is where my story really starts from dealing with trauma to coming to where I am now. So we go up into those mountains of Colorado, you know, we gave, we lost everything. We gave away our company. Uh, my dad was not fighting anymore, so the money that we had that was making us comfortable was gone overnight. We went from making my parents went from making a lot of money to like, how are we going to survive a year off twenty six thousand yeah. um, dollars? My parents had a, had their cars repossessed. Um, we had to go to the church to get canned food. Uh, go to these potlucks at our church to bring food home so that we could have food for the week. When when I tell you like we traded a life. For ministry we traded everything for ministry because we believed in it that much and so god called my dad to start this and he ran with it and living in colorado was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me but also one of the one of the worst um because that i went into this small town of like a thousand people and i went in there as the new popular kid and i tried to run through all the women that i could and this was my first year of high school. Uh, Randy Couture is my wrestling coach. His coach was uh, Brad Anderson. Like these guys were Olympic athletes. Yeah, and anyway, I think for like listeners who don't really understand who Randy Couture is, I mean, you can Google the guy right now. He's like, it's not your average Joe. Like he's got a pretty strong following. So I can imagine you as a high school kid, like, yeah, I'm training with Randy Couture. Like you probably acted like your shit didn't stink. <laughs> yeah, he thought you were special of some sort. Absolutely, okay. yeah, Randy. I mean, Randy is a UFC Hall of Famer. Like, yeah. that was the best opportunity and training I've ever had in my life. How was that? It was insane. Our wrestling gym was at 10,000 feet elevation. I was in the best shape of my life. I mean, I was... Talking about grinding it out, huh? Yeah, yeah. like, we... we our, our practices were about three hours long and an hour straight of cardio. And it was... I mean, we produced some of the toughest athletes, uh, in my opinion, in the United States through our wrestling program. Yeah. There was only about 17 of us, but we were all like stellar athletes. And uh, you know, all, all the guys in this area, they're just country boys. Like all these 
kids that were on my wrestling team, they worked on a farm, they went to school, and they wrestled. Yeah. And when they graduated high school, they worked on the farm. And not the dudes you want to get in a tussle yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we became really close. We became a close community. And uh, so that kind of fueled my my pride. That kind of fueled uh, me going after these women and, and you know, being a dumb teenager. And uh, we moved back to Texas uh, a few years, uh, a year and a half later. And uh, we were coming back down here to Magnolia. Uh, we were going to build our headquarters down here. And we were wanting to take Mighty Oaks to the next step. We were wanting to, to create a program uh, that would last five days long and make it our own. We wanted to really solidify what we did. Because when we first started, we were taking seven veterans into our ranch in Colorado, a ranch, not our ranch, a ranch that we yeah. were using for a year straight. Well, we found out real quick that didn't work. Yeah, That was like just failure waiting to happen. So drama. J- just jump a little bit ahead and just to kind of give the listeners an understanding. You're explaining just where you started with Mighty Oaks, but can you tell me about a rough estimate of how many veterans you've reached out to, law enforcement and families that you've you guys have helped to this day? Yeah, so we've had about four, we have had over 4,500 um, alumni come through one of our recovery programs. So we have uh, the national program and we have, or we have the legacy program and the women's program. Our legacy program is open up to males um, who served in the military, so veterans, active duty military, first responders, and the spouses. So if I'm a if I'm a dude and my wife is a cop, I can come through our program. For our, the female program, the female legacy program, it's consisted of mainly spouses that come through. Yeah. We we get the occasional <clears throat> woman that is in the military or woman that is a cop. They come through our program. Out of those students, out of those alumni that have come through, not one of them has paid a single dollar to come through our program. So we fundraise every single cent for them, including travel, to come through our program. So over four and a half thousand. So that's our recovery program. Our we have an aftercare program that maintains connection with our alumni after they come through one of our programs. Uh, our advocacy program, we do a lot of advocacy work in DC. Um, obviously right now with the current administration, it's a little bit more challenging than it was with uh, President Trump, but we do a lot of advocacy work in uh, the Capitol. Yeah. And then international, uh, we do international work, which I'll get into yeah. um, in a little bit, but our international work, um, what we do We've done a lot of different things in the past, and a lot of people associate the Robo Show name with doing some crazy cowboy stuff, but <laughs> we've settled down, and we now do international resiliency training with yeah. foreign um, countries, or I should say foreign allies to the United States. So a friendly country to the U.S. will go into that friendly country, and we'll help train uh, their chaplains or their military in resiliency, and, and I'll get more into that yeah. when we start talking about international stuff but mighty oaks didn't start with all these things mighty oaks started with my mom and dad um coming to a table just like this and putting pen to paper and creating this idea because god put it on their hearts and it grew so i want to say something like i guess you're from hearing your dad in another conversation it looks like the whole organization all in all has helped almost about five hundred thousand people is that what it was kind of yeah yeah Yeah. so I, i I, I'm sure. It's I mean, I'm sure you guys are just that. counting. Yeah. yeah, but that's huge. Because yeah, something I think uh, a lot of people have slightly started to talk about it, but yeah. especially for veterans coming out, there's not. You see a lot of organizations helping, like for example, the special operations community, just specifically them. Yeah, which I mean, don't get me wrong, help those guys all they need. I mean, they've seen some stuff, right? But there hasn't been too many big organizations that actually just target not only the service member, but their family, right? Yeah. And I think that's huge. Like, that's, that's, and then the fact that you just said, no, you're, like, you're getting paid to go to these places. Like, basically, yeah. you're, you're, you don't have any worry. You're just there to fix what's going on with that person. Yeah. And I think that's huge. And I, my hat off to you guys for that because that's like, it takes a special man, a special person to be able to say, I'm going to, 
risk it all and try to help somebody. And just to hear the story of how you guys started, basically broke, not having much. I think that was God's plan, right? Yeah. Put you in the bottom of the barrel so you can feel what it's like and bring you right back up. So that way yeah. when you do teach, when you do help, you know what it's like to be down there too. So I just really wanted to point that out before we got any further because I think what you guys are doing with Mighty Oaks is huge. Um, that was one of the reasons why I've been drawn both to your story and to your father's because yeah, all the other, like I heard your dad's podcast the other day. I was like, oh my goodness, he left me stunned, right? And hearing that, yeah, it's cool. And it's it not, not, I'm saying cool, like, oh yeah, cool story, bro. No, no, that's a, it's, it's a very moving story. But what you guys are doing after all these things you guys have done in your life is huge, right? Yeah. Because there's a lot of people out there that have seen that same thing you and your father have seen, and they need that extra little bit of support. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my goal here too, right? It's bringing like-minded individuals to talk about those kind of things where we can potentially find a veteran who's out there who feels lost, who doesn't have that support, right? That's yeah. my goal. And that's why I wanted to bring you on here because I think Mighty Oaks is an amazing foundation that these people can go and do. I mean, like I told you before we started the podcast, I want to try it out, right? Like yeah. I want to see what it's like because I have my own personal issues. So. Thank you again. That's awesome. And obviously we'll touch back on the rest of Mighty Oaks because yeah. I know you got some pretty big stuff to tell me about that. This episode is brought to you by Grind Ops Coffee Company. Established in 2021, Grind Ops Coffee Company offers handcrafted fluid bed roasted coffee to suit any tactical outdoor and or hectic lifestyle. It was founded on the principles of grit, grind, and perseverance. Their mission is to fuel your mindset for any op. Serving as a canine handler, with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, founder Aaron Mesa drank coffee as a staple that fueled his day. As a natural-born tinker, he began experimenting with different roasting methods and flavor profiles. After lots of trial and error, Aaron had some damn good coffee. Aaron's dedication to Grind Ops Coffee Company mirrors the commitments he demonstrated to his country. Grind Ops Coffee Company helps support military and first responder nonprofit organizations. Law enforcement officer owned and operated Grind Ops Coffee Company. Go check them out today. GrindOpsCoffeeCo.com. Link will be in description. Check them out today. You're in high school. Yep. You're, you're uh, Hunter Robichaux. Fresh who's, meat, who's as my cool. wife would say. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're freaking <laughs> training with Randy Couture. You, you're like, you know, you're badass is what people say, right? <laughs> yeah. so, That's what I like to think yeah. of myself when I was yeah. at that age. Yeah, and, and yeah. you grew up in a Marine Corps family, am I correct? Like, yeah. yeah. You see, yep. You're a grandfather and... Your your dad obviously, and yep. he wasn't just your typical marine. Like he did some some wild stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so at this point in your life, you you're in high school. Do you know you want to be a marine at this point? Yeah, yeah. So like, my goal from childhood was to be a marine. I wanted that's what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do that. It wasn't a question of if I was going to do it. It was literally when I was 14 years or 15 years old. We're driving, and my dad is on the phone with a recruiter for me trying to get a waiver for me to get in Like when I'm 16. I'm like, Dad, I'm not even out of high school yet. He's like, well, we'll figure it out and get you a diploma so you can go. I'm like, how is that even doable? Yeah. You know. So like, my dad was trying to get me into the Marine Corps. I wanted to go into the Marine Corps. It was like I knew that that was what I was going to do with my life. And so... Uh, when we moved back to Texas, I started talking to Marine Corps recruiters. I ended up dropping into homeschool to graduate quicker, getting my high school diploma. And then we moved to California. We moved to San Luis Obispo, California, because one of the locations that we hold our program is out there. And so my dad and I moved out there a little bit before my family to uh, a little town just north of San Luis Obispo called San Miguel. Okay. In San Miguel, you have Sky Rose Ranch, which is where we host one of our recovery programs at. And uh, so my dad stayed up, my dad and I stayed up there for a little bit. I was kind of a beach bum at this point. I, I got my high school diploma. I was working as a ranch hand. Um, I was working at Starbucks and then I'd go surf almost every morning. So like. I was living a cush yeah. life. Like, yeah. literally didn't have to pay rent at my parents. I was waking up at six, or 5.30, going surfing, going to Starbucks. And when I wasn't at Starbucks, I'd go to the ranch, do some ranch work, and come, go surfing yeah. again, go home and sleep. It what was like, yeah. chill. Like, yeah. that was, like, no so... No worry whatsoever. No yeah. worry at all. Yeah. Like, 
you know, my hair was like super blonde. Like I would literally fit the part of some California surfer boy that worked on a ranch yeah. and then also worked at Starbucks, which was really weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but then it clicked in my head. I'm like, man, like I've been doing this for like six or seven months now. Like what the heck am I doing? And so I'd like to, at this point in my life, I want, I want to reverse a little bit, um, to six months before before where we just ended uh because this is like the the biggest moment in my entire life this is where god completely changed me and so in uh in in the summer of 2014 um my my best friend colin he's my childhood best friend his parents his mom and stepdad um bought me um basically an admissions fee into the summer camp out in tyler called pine cove and they bought me a plane ticket from california to um houston to to get me into the summer camp and i thought it was going to be the dumbest thing ever because i've never been some, like this kid or teenager that wanted to hang out with other kids i was like man these kids don't know what i've been through yeah they all like watching video or cartoons and playing video games like i want to be out fishing or i want to be surfing like yeah. i want to go do completely different things than they do and i and i feel like i'm more mature than the counselors that are at this this dumb thing yeah you're like that, i could teach them something exactly <laughs> yeah. but i went and i only and i think the only reason i went is because god kept on pushing me to go even though i didn't see it and i didn't realize it yeah midweek in this camp i accepted christ and uh my life changed um and i can't tell you how like crazy that night was how how radical of a change from the man the boy that went into this camp and the man that came out of it within five days just complete radical change and shift in my life um i go home and i feel like i'm on fire for the lord i feel like my whole entire life um, has purpose i feel like it has meaning because that pastor that was up there um talking about his life was almost an exact mirror of mine yeah and uh so I get connected into a youth group. Um, I become really good friends with uh, a few guys. One of them is now a pastor at the church that I was in this youth group. Um, and we all became super close. We all became um, very meshed together. Like we went through life together. And uh, this was around the time that I was like, all right, we gotta make the decision. Like I can either work at Starbucks and surf and be a ranch hand my whole life, or I can, actually fulfill this goal and dream Stick of being plan. a United yeah. States Marine. And so I went to uh, a recruiter in San Jose, Staff Sergeant Soto, and I said, basically, I want to be in the Marine Corps. And, <laughs> of course, I have my dad with me, yeah. so then he's not going to try to do anything stupid because yeah. then my dad is going to be like, what's this right here? Yeah, like, exactly. And so I saw the job options that were available for the reserves because my dad was like, hey, like, if I were you, I would go into the reserves. You get treated better while being in the reserves you get to have a civilian life still you can go to college um kind of focus on some things outside of the marine corps while still being in the marine corps no i think that's a good that's a good point i, I don't yeah. want to interrupt you on that but i mean like when i swap, swapped into the reserves it was it was really big for me because i feel like that's where i became more successful at life because mm -hmm. i still had that purpose of what i needed to do yeah. to be a marine uphold that standard of being a marine but i also had this drive and it made me become successful. It also bit me in the butt, and that's a podcast later on in the future <laughs> that I'm gonna talk about. It, it made me feel like I was on top of the world, yeah. and I fell a bit, but it also helped me get right into that path that I needed to. Because I've seen some people go to the reserves straight off and then just don't do anything with it, and I am a US Marine, yeah. and they make that mistake. But when you're in the reserves, use that to your advantage. Yeah. And if there's listeners listening that are that have that you know, potential idea in their head, if you're gonna to go to the reserves, make sure you make something out of it. Like, don't come out with no plan, right? So I think that yeah. that was a, that was really good advice from your father. Yeah, and and I mean, it made sense to me. And a lot of people like to hate on reservists, but yeah. some of the smartest Marines and best Marines I've ever worked with are reservists. Um, and I'm not not saying that there isn't the same thing in active duty, um, but you guys, you have guys that are legit, like. FBI operators, guys that are on yeah. what is a HRT teams yeah. like these guys are are legit people. You have doctors, you have pilots, 
Yeah. They're in the reserves and yeah. they're enlisted. They're living normal yeah. lives and then they got to <laughs> yeah. go do everything a Marine yeah. does in a month, in a weekend. You know? Exactly. It's, like, it's wild. Yeah. So, um, but obviously you have your units that are, that are better than others in, in the reserves. And I was fortunate enough to be in a unit that was good and we had a very uh, good deployment schedule. So uh, I met a guy um, at our program. Uh, he was a gunny in the Marine Corps, Gunny Shep. And Gunny Shep, you know, just one of the most incredible um, Marines that I've ever met. He, he was a Marine's Marine. Yeah. And uh, he was with this unit called Anglico. And he started talking to me about Anglico, and I was like, that's what I want to do. No one hears about Anglico. No. It's a great kept secret of the Marine Corps, and I hope the Marine Corps keeps it a secret because it'll keep the trash out. And I don't say that in a very, like, demeaning way, but I love Anglico so much that I want Anglico to continue to be protected. Yeah. Um, so he's telling me about Anglico, and I'm like, that's exactly what I want to do. I love airplanes, and I want to uh, call in bombs from those airplanes. I want to call in bombs from artillery, yeah. and I want to call in bombs off um, naval gunships. And so growing up, I watched the Pacific, and the Pacific... Uh, Eugene Sledge in that movie was a forward observer. So he's calling naval gunfire and artillery on uh, the Japanese soldiers uh, in the South Pacific. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Like, Eugene Sledge did this, I want to yeah. do that. And he wrote that book, uh, The Old Breed. And it's about the Marines in the South Pacific. And I was like, that is what I want to do. Like, I want to be in the South Pacific calling on naval guns. Yeah. And so, um, you know, Shep just kind of amplified amplified it for me he told me about all the cool things you get to do in Anglico you get to go to jump school um, if you're lucky enough you can go to dive uh, go to TACP you get all these cool certifications um, be able to embed with special operation forces not only within our own um, military but in foreign militaries as well I think uh, something I I wanted to point out just of how you talk about keeping Anglico under under the rug a bit I mean I even told you this I was a marine I am a Marine, right? We, we, there's no such yeah. thing as it was. We are Marines. And <laughs> I even told you when we were talking on the phone, Anglico, like I had my slight understanding of what Anglico yeah. is. I, I call them the, the calm wizards, right? <laughs> like they do something, I don't know exactly what they do, but just to kind of give a small clarification to listeners is like, you're very similar to a JTAC with more capabilities, right? Like, is that is that kind of where we're at? Not, I'm not saying you're a JTAC, but you mm -hmm. have your you got similar capabilities, right? Because everything's yeah. JTACs are phenomenal. like, And they are. Yeah. They, they got, oh, they can call in airstrikes and do all these cool things and stuff. But there's something that Anglico has that not a lot of other people have. And yeah. that's that naval gunfire. Y right? you, have, you have Division One JTACs, and then you have, what is it, D2. Yeah. Anglico makes D D1 there you go. JTACs. Yeah. And uh, not everybody in Anglico is a JTAC, but the guys that are, are D1. That yeah. That is what we do. You can have a JTAC assigned to an artillery battery. Yeah. And, all he's going to get to do is do close air support yeah. and coordinate with artillery. Yeah. With Anglico, you're working with, you could be working with the Brits, the Kiwis, um, the Aussies, like Japs yeah. or Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know who, yeah. who you're going to be working with, but in Anglico, you're you're working with all these foreign um, militaries. Yeah. And, and it's great. Like that's, I wanted to work with, with other people. I wanted to see other countries. And Anglico did it the best. Uh, uh, the Air Force has has TAC P's and they have yeah. combat controllers. The Marine Corps and Navy, we have JTACs. Yeah. And the Army, they have Fisters. They don't have JTACs in the Army. Yeah, I was, I yeah. was confused about all the names. And yes, it's combat controllers, right? Yeah. The Air Force is with it. Those yeah. are the guys that TAC I'm a little P's more. TAC yeah. P's are usually assigned to Rangers, yeah. uh, Ranger regiments, and uh, combat controllers are more your tier one. Those yeah. guys are like very very legit um air controllers so so you get you go you do all your training to become an anglico marine you're in the reserves right everybody's yeah. always a reservist what happens then yeah so went to mcrd san diego uh went to fort Sill, and then went to coronado finished all all my training up uh, to become a forward observer and i was like i finally got the job i wanted i'm in the marine corps um, my time's coming up for my active duty service and all my training is going to be done. I got to go check into my unit, which I was terrified of for some reason at the time. Hey, <laughs> <is it right? laughs> and, uh, 
So my two little ribbons. Okay. Yeah, or my my one. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, how how is this gonna work out? So um, I check into Sixth Anglico up in Northern California, and uh, it was nothing crazy. I didn't even get to drill with them because between the time I checked in to the time that there would be the first drill, I was moving to Temecula, which is just outside of uh, Pendleton. Yeah. And so I checked into Third Anglico. And Third Anglico was the unit I was at my entire, pretty much my entire career. And uh, some of the some of the greatest memories I have in my life are with that unit. Um, some of the most amazing leaders I've ever met in my life uh, that molded me to become the man that I am today um, are are at that unit. Gunnery, Gunnery Sergeant Valesteros, he's now a Master Sergeant, um, one of the most influential Marines uh, that's taken me under his wing. Uh, Top Espinosa, he was uh, my FIC chief, or technically our staff in COIC in Afghanistan. Um, he is an amazing man, uh, taught me a lot. Him and I got into it in Afghanistan because he is like so like mission oriented that if you don't like fall in line with him it's almost like you'll get blown away by him yeah um but i learned so much from him and now i'm he's one of my closest friends and and mentors to this day um obviously you have shepler uh, who i talked about earlier staff sergeant martinez staff sergeant peterson you know just all these great marines that came around me when i got to that unit it wasn't like you're the boot we're gonna destroy you yeah it was yeah you're the boot and you're the new guy but we're gonna take you under our wing and we're gonna teach you the way basically of how to be a jedi and like you I know Angle that, nerdy <laughs> that's a cool thing that i noticed in the marine corps right is yeah like we we bust each other's balls like hard yeah. only you can be mean to the other marine right yeah. anybody else tries that you're in trouble right it's like the whole only we can be mean to doc anybody makes yeah. fun of doc because he's in the navy you're gonna get shredded right yeah but i think that's the cool thing about the marine corps is You'll find those Marines that are typically want to just beat that Marine down, and that's what they're there for, but they yeah. get weeded out. And then you have those Marines that they'll beat you down, but they're also showing you that they're beating you down for a reason. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where I've – I mean, I won't mention his name because he's still doing some pretty high-speed stuff um, on the outside, but I had a first sergeant at the time where, God, that guy just like – whenever times were tough or whatever, he'd just come up to you and be like, hey, man, you're a fucking gunfighter. Snap out of that shit. Like, dude, he, he was the kind of guy – somebody made a mistake – he hated paper like yeah. there's there's no article 15s and stuff in his eyes like he was like let's fix this guy first yeah let's put him in the right path and he motivated a bunch of marines at my unit right and to this day a lot of us still talk highly of him yeah i won't say his name again because he's still doing some pretty crazy stuff on the outside of the marine corps but that man was motivating and to me like a lot of my motivation now comes from him right so mm-hmm. i can understand like you say you got this group of people already in a small community that's not large as it is and then you got a a big group of mentors around you i think that's huge right because what better than surrounding yourself with people like that so yeah and and all these guys were like legit war fighters (laughs) from the invasion of afghanistan yeah all these guys were in hellman so i had a lot of respect for them it wasn't like some some just random marine that's never been to combat (laughs) and has never done these things in live scenarios because there's a major freaking difference between doing um the Anglico mission it's different and the training are coming at and, you. Yeah, yeah. and in combat. And so I had a lot of respect for these guys. So when I got basically checked into my unit, I, I had to figure out what I was going to do. I was like, I can either be like the typical reservist um, in the Marine Corps, or I can do what I feel like God is calling me to do and learn more and invest more time into him. And I was like, how can I do that? I was like, you know what? Bible college. There is a Bible college 20 minutes away from my house called Calvary Chapel Bible College. Um, Chuck Smith was the pastor that started Calvary Chapel. And, you know, I was like, that's the one I'm going to go to. Like, I I love Chuck Smith. Um, I want to go here to learn the Bible. Like, I know what God has for me. I know what God is teaching me. Like, but I want to know who God is. Like, I want to pour my as much of myself into his word as I can 
um, that way my spirit can be filled and I can find like real healing. Cause yeah, I still struggled with the things that happened to me growing up, um, throughout those few months since that camp or since I accepted Christ, Correct. but I knew, I knew what was right. And I wanted to, to learn more about the yeah, Bible. You were aware already of it. Yeah. So I went to Bible college. It was one of the greatest things in my life. Um, uh, I, I learned so much there. I was able to find true healing through Christ there. Like it was exactly what I needed, but it was so outside of my zone. Like when I say outside of my zone, like these kids that I was with were homeschooled their entire life. Like their parents were pastors. Like it was like, this is way out of my norm. Like when you, you got you like throwing food on a highway, and yeah, getting left behind at a hotel and all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Too. Like, Oh, all right. I don't relate. Yeah, to you. like yeah. some of the some of the jokes that I would say, like they look at me like I was Lucifer. Yeah, and I was like, I promise, like I didn't mean that in a way that was like, like I'm gonna mean. pray for I'm you just, tonight, brother. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I was I was kind of the rough one in Bible college. Like if people are gonna laugh at this, but I almost got kicked out of Bible college for taking girls to a country club swing dancing, <laughs> like every week. And so like that, like that's not even that bad. We weren't yeah. out going out getting drunk or drinking alcohol. Yeah. But like, you know, there was these rules in yeah. place for a certain reason so that you can become closer to Christ. And I was breaking these rules, yeah. but like I, I had to learn. But like, in, your, in your mind and the way you've kind of been coming up, <laughs> like you're just going out to dance. Yeah, like, I was so going out that, to dance, right? yeah. but then I like, you know, it makes more sense. Like, yeah, like I'm, there's just certain stuff like that you, didn't click with my head because yeah these people lived very completely different life than I did growing up. So at what point, like in all this, you go to Bible college or anything, then you go to Afghanistan, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, while I was in Bible college, I got selected for a deployment to Syria. Okay. And at this time, uh, there was a few artillery batteries from the Marine Corps in Syria. And I was like, finally, dude, like I'm going to go get to kill ISIS. Like yeah. I joined the Marine Corps. Um, if you join the Marine Corps, you join the Marine Corps to do, some very specific things Correct. and those very specific things involve killing evil evil human beings yeah. and that's what i wanted to do i i didn't have a, a heart of i want to kill i have a heart of i want to get rid of evil that is on this planet yes. and i think if you join the marine corps and you don't have that that feeling or that calling you're in the wrong gun club. you might be you might yeah. be in the wrong job yeah. because that's what the marine corps does the marine corps like is to destroy the enemy mm -hmm. and by like that's what i wanted to do and if you're not in the marine corps to do that you're probably not in the right place yeah. um you have the air force um for that <laughs> they make the best pilots yeah. on the planet but you know there's a lot of good jobs in the air force for people that don't have that that right. calling um but i saw innocent people being murdered by these evil human beings and so when i heard that there was this deployment to syria i was like this is my opportunity yeah well then, uh, that deployment gets pulled, and I was pretty bummed. And that was in two thousand, uh, the end of two thousand sixteen, beginning of two thousand seventeen. Mm -hmm. I think I signed deployment papers. What year did Trump get elected? Was it two thousand eighteen? Was it eighteen or sixteen? Because he got, yeah, no, it was, it was sixteen. Because remember, he ran for the twenty twenty campaign, and that's when Biden ended yeah. up taking twenty so, twenty. Yeah. yeah. So around that time, around that time, I signed those papers for, yeah. for Syria. And uh, I got, it got dropped and I was pretty upset about that. Like the deployment didn't happen yeah. for, for us. They got handed off to first thing yeah. Um, and they had, they had fun. Yeah. And so it made it even worse. Uh, during that time, North Korea was a really big thing. So my unit was like basically prepared to go to North Korea. I remember my, yeah. my Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Vance coming out. He said, you boys better be ready because in six months we're going to be in a foxhole calling in naval gunfire on North Koreans and having the Marine Corps ball with zebra cakes. Yeah. And I was like, oh, dude. Yeah. Like, That'd this be a is whole different get, war. This <laughs> is about to get crazy. Yeah. Um, obviously, that never happened. Yeah. Thank God, because that would have been World War. Yeah. Like, we're already in World War Three, but that would have been the yeah. beginning. <laughs> it would, yeah. It would have been yeah. the beginning of it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Afghanistan comes up right after that. Uh, I got selected uh, for this deployment to Afghanistan. Basically, they put out the memo at our unit. They said, hey, we have a, a rotation coming up to Afghanistan. Who wants to go? Obviously, a ton, ton of dudes at the unit raised their hand. There was only 13 slots available. Yeah. 
and uh, my captain or my major at the time was in charge of it and uh, you know him and I had always been pretty close um, I was always kind of looked at as like the the guy that a lot of older Marines wanted to take under their wing and so I had a good I had a good chance of getting into the deployment I worked really hard I made myself known among above all the other guys at my unit um, I wanted to be the guy that that was going to be asked to deploy I didn't want to be forced I wanted to be wanted yeah. uh, to go on a deployment and I made it um, so in Anglico we have brigades um, basically just yeah. like platoons uh, it was myself uh, my buddy Latham Luke Kelly uh, Freeman Espinosa and some of the these are just some of the closest guys that I was already close to in my unit we all got picked and this is such a god thing and I feel like it's such a such a big part of my story and uh, I write about this in my book uh, that I'm writing I write about how God pulled us like literally us all together years prior to this join the Marine Corps get into third Anglico become really close friends and then we all deploy together yeah um, we are all still like best friends to this That's day awesome. we we all of us talk to each other almost every every single day and uh, the thing that is so so special about the our us group of guys is that we are all like-minded in Christ awesome. um, we're all Christians and we all come from Christian families it's not like we're some guys that are like till Valhalla type yeah, of yeah. warriors. Like we're literally like what the Bible describes it's as a big as group of biblical. drunken bastards. No, it's different. Yeah, yeah. no, like <laughs> we we play foosball and some of the guys drink some beer. But like we we were in a reunion a few weeks ago in Arizona, uh, the four four of us, and we're playing foosball with each other. Yeah. Instead of being like the typical Marine that goes to a strip club and is like doing cocaine <laughs> off some hookers' butt. <laughs> Yeah. Like something stupid like yeah, that. No, like we're, we're like very different. And you know, God brought us together and God kept us and God made us like-minded so that when yeah. we went to combat together, we were able to go through the, the hardships of combat yeah. together um, and point each other to Christ, which is, I mean, you, you form very strong relationships and bonds with men in combat, but there's nothing like um, godly warrior men forming these relationships with each other i mean there i i can't explain it correctly but like i literally felt like we had such an advantage over the taliban um because of our obviously our relationship yeah. with christ but because of literally the the unity that so our team had to to also kind of bring a little light on your deployment in afghanistan and, and what you were doing you were not attached to american forces there was american forces with you obviously yeah but you were helping one of our allies mm -hmm. you, you were an anglico marine for them yeah right and are you are you able to discuss what ally you were working with or yeah yeah, yeah. so we were working uh with the georgians the country of georgia yeah. uh south of russia it's on the eastern bank of the black sea and uh awesome little country really small but these guys are warriors like they're like little miniature Vikings, yeah. <laughs> they're awesome. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, we got to work with them. We got attached to the Georgian Infantry Battalion. Uh, we were going to be their eyes and ears of the sky for aircraft, um, artillery. Yeah. Uh, obviously we didn't have naval guns because we're in the middle of Afghanistan. Right. Um, but we were gonna be their, their fires control. Uh, there was a few, uh, about I think 60 to 70 Marines total on our deployment. Mm -hmm. Um, the rest of the guys, so there was 13 of us. The rest of the guys were just regular infantry O3s, uh, nothing crazy. Just ready to mow things down. Yeah, ready to mow things down. Yeah. Um, some viewers might on here might know uh, Connor Tor with Tor Knives. Tor was on our team. Um, there's some other some other really cool dudes uh, that were, you know, just amazing amazing grunts that like we had the opportunity to serve with. Um, but you know, just the Marines that we were with, like we were kind of on our own. We kind of did our own thing. Yeah. Um, we didn't have a lot of rules. Like we yeah. kind of just made do, yeah. you know? So did you get to call plenty of fire on the Taliban? 
<laughs> yeah, we our, our team did did quite a bit of fires. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think um, that's kind of something where you have people who have gone, and I'm not taking from anybody that's gone to Afghanistan. If people have gone, they've kind of really didn't get to experience Afghanistan in certain ways. And yeah. then there's people that they got to experience it yeah. in some very uncomfortable ways. Mm-hmm. Um, one, glad you're, you're home safe, you know, and, and everything. But not that I'm trying to short your Afghanistan trip because I know that was huge. You went after the Taliban and stuff. But when you came home from Afghanistan, you did some stuff that I think is huge and important. And I know Afghanistan was huge and important. And you're, you're putting the fight on Taliban, right? Yeah. Dropping warheads on foreheads, yeah. right? Good thing, right? But what you came back and did is like huge and amazing, right? Because everybody perceives this whole thing. Oh, you go to Afghanistan, you're this warrior, you come back, you're like this badass, whatever. Mm-hmm. But you did some pretty humbling things. And I really want to touch that now. Yeah. Because I think that that's huge. So the Afghan, I'm, not that I want to jump around, but the Afghan withdrawal, you're still in the reserves at this time, right? Yeah. But you're helping out your father and his team of guys. And there's something huge happens in Afghanistan, the withdrawal. And, and as we all know, the withdrawal was, I hate to curse a lot, but it was a big sack of shit. Yeah. We, we, we really messed that one up, right? And I say we because as a country, we did fail that, that withdrawal. And we all know where it came from, but... It was a big it was a big failure the way we got Americans out of there and the people that were helping us out there, right? We mm-hmm. kind of let a lot of them down. But then Hunter Robichaud and his boys come in and do some pretty big things. And I think I want to touch on that because what you guys did out there was huge and I think it needs to be said. It's been said already by other sources, but I want you to touch on that because I know you played a huge role in it. Yeah. So can you explain to me where you were at when that happened and what happened from there. This episode is brought to you by Team Room Tactical. Team Room Tactical was founded by Green Beret veterans to honor the culture and history of our armed forces. At Team Room Tactical, they offer a premier Cerakote and laser engraving service. They specialize in elevating your firearms and an extensive array of products to new levels of personalization and sophistication. Their team of skilled individuals combine state-of-the-art technology with meticulous craftsmanship to bring your visions to life. Whether you're looking to add a unique touch to your firearms, enhance the aesthetic of your accessories, or create memorable gifts, They offer a tailored experience to meet your individual needs. From vibrant color schemes to intricate engravings, they take pride in delivering unparalleled quality and attention to detail. They transform ordinary items into extraordinary pieces that reflect your style and personality with their custom Cerakote and laser engraving services. Head on over to teamroomtactical.com and get your custom services done by these guys. Amazing dudes doing amazing things. Go check them out, teamroomtactical.com. Cool. So you come back home, Afghanistan. Yeah. You are, we're, we're now talking about the withdrawal of Afghanistan. What are you doing that day? So I want to take it back a yeah, step. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So when I was six years old, I had a dream. Yeah. And this is probably the most profound portion of what I'm about to talk about. Yeah. When I was six years old, my dad and I had a, or I had a dream that my dad and I were in some foreign country um, and we were behind these barriers. Um, we, we didn't have any guns on us. We had basically some first aid kits and that was it. And uh, these women and children were running to us. And, uh, you know, these, these women and children were obviously Middle Eastern. Because the women had burkas on, uh, children yeah. were um, in their Afghan clothing, and I didn't think too much of it at that time. But I believe, I truly believe, with all my heart, and soul, that God put that vision on my on my mind and on my heart for a reason. And uh, there's bad guys, Taliban, behind these women and children, mowing them down. And my dad and I hop over these barriers, and we're running to those women and children that are being shot up and grabbing them and bringing them to the other side of this barrier to safety. And I didn't think about it too much until um, I joined the Marine Corps. And I was like, okay, this doesn't really relate because my dad and I aren't together in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, but then I heard that the withdrawal was going to happen. And my dad, so that's the dream. Yeah. When I heard the withdrawal was going to happen, I was like, are we going to do anything? Like my dad's a very like powerful man. It seems like, are we going to do something? Yeah. Sure enough. My dad had his, uh, interpreter Aziz in country still. Obviously I worked with a bunch of interpreters, ANA guys, 
um, in the country. And I was like, man, I want to try to help out too. And so um, my dad created a plan uh, to get Aziz out. Well, that plan failed because they weren't like allowing any of those guys, the SIVs, to leave the country. Um, and the Taliban were making it really hard to travel Jeez. within the country because all the provinces were collapsing. So if I'm the world's most powerful military and I say I'm going to pull every single one of my troops out of this country before September 1st, 2022, and I am the enemy, what am I going to do? Yeah, I'd be, be like, these hard. idiots are leaving. Heck yeah. Like we're going to have our country back. Yeah. Like if, if China invaded the United States today, took over all of our major cities and they said, hey, we're going to leave January 1st, 2024 or 2025. We know what I'm going to get back. all my boys together and we're going to figure out a way to take our country back. Yep. Like that's exactly what happened with the Taliban. Yeah. They're idiots, but they're not dumb. No, they exactly. knew exactly what they were doing. And so they took that. They took back the country. They were taking it province by province, taking over Afghan uh, military bases, um, Bagram which was the biggest yeah heartbreaking to see because Bagram was a stronghold um, in Central Asia many people think ba Afghanistan is in the Middle East it's not in the Middle East it's in C Central Asia so they took Bagram and when I saw Bagram taken over I was like that's it like Afghanistan's gone it's done yeah. and um, Aziz was in hiding with his family um, and my dad was like in full panic mode like how the heck am i going to get my buddy out of here like they were calling aziz saying that we're gonna uh, rape your wife and your daughters and we're gonna kill them in front of you while you watch your sons are going to be molested and, and killed in front of you like just some crazy yeah. horrific things that very evil um, people would say and so my dad was like well if if nobody's going to do anything about it if the government isn't going to do anything about it i'm going to do something about it and so my dad said that he was going to go get Aziz. I said, well, you're an old man. You've been out of the game for a while. I just was there. Like, I'm going with you. And he said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. Yeah. Like, I'm going yeah. to get Aziz with you. I'm going to, to help rescue, these, rescue Aziz and his family. Because at the time, this rescue operation was only for Aziz and his family. Yeah. We, we raised enough money to get Aziz and his family out of the country. And so... I bought tickets for my dad and I uh, to go to Abu Dhabi. And this was when COVID was like crazy. Basically, yeah. the United Arab Emirates, you couldn't get in, you couldn't get out. It was like the most secure place on the planet. And uh, one of our teammates had a connection with the royal family, um, the sheik of, of, of Abu Dhabi. And because of him um we were able to get into the country and when we got there um that day we got there is the day that aziz was pulled out of afghanistan we form or we got a team together of pararescue operators from the from the air force and they pulled aziz and his family out very crazy story very detailed on how they did it um, but they were able to get him out yeah. safely um him, his wife and his kids and, uh, you know, it's a total miracle and a total blessing that God ordained everything to fall into place yeah. to, for Aziz and his family to get out. Well, we thought that was going to be it, and that wasn't it. Oh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so one of our teammates basically said, hey, there's, there's a bunch of orphans that need to get out of the country, and we need to get them out like well we can't leave these kids behind it's like one of yeah. those puppy commercials like yeah. you see a puppy you got to give five bucks yeah. to the puppy yeah well like these were human beings yeah, these were kids. children that needed to be rescued because these kids were either gonna, the males were going to be brought up to be taliban fighters or the females were going to be married off to a taliban fighters and yeah. and basically just rape their whole yeah. life and we didn't we we felt like it was our obligation to rescue these these orphans wow we got them out and uh, eight, 800, 811 or 809 people we had out within the first like three or five days. And, uh, you know, it was, I was like, wow, that's a lot. That's amazing. Like, 
you know, God brought us here to rescue Aziz and his family, yeah. and then we get almost a thousand people out. Yeah. And then it kept on going. I sent emails, I sent text out to every lieutenant colonel and major I knew, to all my staff NCO buddies. I was like, hey, if you worked with Afghan interpreters, I need their information. Here's the email to send their their like information to. And then that email just flooded. We got like, I think 30,000 requests within a week of these Afghan SIVs. And we're like, oh crap, like this is, yeah. like we just, put ourselves in a position where we, we kind of have to help. Yeah. And so my dad, my dad's really good at raising money. My yeah. dad knows a lot of really wealthy people that, that love to give money to help out with stuff like yeah. this. He made a call to Glenn Beck and asked Glenn Beck to raise some money. Glenn, Black, Glenn Beck thought he was only gonna raise a few thousand. He ended up raising over $40 million. Wow. Now and you're so in. we're like, all right, we're in this for the long haul. Yeah. We start getting Afghans brought into the United Arab Emirates. Um, into their humanitarian city. One of the most amazing things that I saw was the United Arab Emirates open up their humanitarian city that they built for refugees from Syria that was fleeing from ISIS. They opened up their humanitarian city to us. So we had a capacity of, I think, 16,000 uh, individuals that we could put in this, uh, this humanitarian wow. city. So we started bringing Afghans to the city. And with that, the UAE gave us their C-17 planes. They didn't give us them. They assigned their Air Force pilots to fly back and forth yeah. from Hkaya and Majra Sharif uh, to get Afghans out of the country and bring them back. Yeah. And it was, I mean, one of the most incredible things I saw was we went there and said, hey, America isn't doing anything, but us American citizens that wore the uniform feel like it's our obligation to do something God. and they hopped on board with us yeah you know this country that that's primarily islam is coming alongside us men that are primarily christians so you have two different religions completely different usually these religions are trying to kill each other and, and i think it's for the viewers <laughs> yeah. here we have that like oh you know like we respect each other nobody you don't see people mowing each other down on the streets of yeah. houston because of religion but in these countries, that's that's a that's thing. what happens. That's a if, thing. Yeah. if if you're found to be a Christian in in Afghanistan, you're beheaded yeah. or you're boiled to death. Something yeah. crazy, right? And it's funny all these activists and stuff here in the U.S. that push for that, especially like with the whole Israel thing and everything. But they don't realize like some of the stuff you are actually agreeing on. The people that you think you're defending won't like you if you go to their country. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. crazy. So I I mean it was crazy how all of this was orchestrated, how all this came together, um, how we got all these human beings out. Um, we had a lot of great people come alongside us, a lot of other great organizations that were working out there that we were, we were able to collaborate with um, because it wasn't just one person. It wasn't just the Robichauds or the Tim Kennedys or the Sarah Verardos, the Save Our Allies, the Mercury Sarah's Ones. Sarah's an awesome girl too, by the yeah, way. Sarah's yeah, awesome, yeah. yeah. And uh, so... We saw some amazing things happen, but it wasn't just one person. It wasn't just one organization. It was multiple organizations and multiple people working together. But the most important thing is that God's hand was in this. Oh yeah. The only reason that this was possible is because God made it possible. Yep. Aziz, Aziz's situation opened up a, a big floodgate of a lot of help and stuff. And I think that's, yeah. like you said, God made, made that situation the way it is. So, all in all, about how many people do you guys think you guys helped get out of Afghanistan? We, our group, 17,000. 17,000. Yeah, and it could be more, it could be yeah. a little less, I don't know. Yeah. Um, because there's still people coming into this day that are yeah. that are linked to us somehow. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's huge yeah. because it, it, it infuriates me to see that, I mean, and what you guys did is amazing. I'm yeah. not gonna take away from that. But it infuriates me that I have to see um, now civilians or, or guys who are in the private sector and all this stuff have to go raise money and do all these things to get out the guys that who have been at war with us this whole time had our backs but our administration was like look we're, we're out by this time this date you didn't make the plane you're done see you later yeah. and and what people don't understand for the viewers is these people aren't going to go live this miserable life in Afghanistan. They're going to get tortured and killed. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you, we saw it within hours of us leaving. They're hanging people off helicopters. Yeah. These guys are evil, like, excuse my language, evil son of a bitch. They, they don't care for human life. They yeah. have 100% disregard for it, especially if you help the Americans. 
Mm -hmm. So to see what you guys did is amazing. I love it, but it also infuriates me, right? Because yeah. I, I hate that our I wish that we didn't like, have to do that. Correct. I wish yeah. we could have just done it the right way and got them out and not have to put all these other guys in the mix, right? Yeah. But I mean, it's amazing. It just shows the kind of Americans we still have in our country, right? Yeah. But I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on that situation because now we're going to get into the next part, right? With yeah. You guys weren't done there. You, you're yeah. definitely not done in Afghanistan. It continues on yeah. um, to now what we get into Ukraine. But I wanted to point out your guys' organization, um, Mighty Oaks and, and Save Our Allies and everything. That's, that's amazing what you guys are doing. And my personal experience is I reached out for a Marine who I had no clue who he was. I had some Marine friends. Hey, there's a Marine back from El Paso. He needs some help. He got out of the Marine Corps, he took off to Ukraine, got jacked up within a few weeks that he was there, lost an eye, pretty much brain dead at this point. We didn't know, but he was jacked up. I had no clue who to reach out to. And I know everybody will bash Tim Kennedy and Dakota Meyer and everything like, oh, they're just all in it for the fame and glory. But I'm a guy with like 10 followers at the time on mm -hmm. Instagram. And I reach out and say, hey man, I'm a Marine. I know a Marine that needs some help. I don't really know this guy, this is a situation. Within hours, I'm talking to Sarah. We're talking about trying to coordinate a plan to get this guy out of Ukraine. And to me, um, I wanted to speak about that because recently I seen another podcast where they like to bash the whole situation of what you guys did out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's all for fame and glory. But yeah, I, I think it needs to be known too by people who actually reached out to you guys and asked for help and got to see that, hey, there is help. It's not this whole side story of just trying to get followers or hey look what we're doing in afghanistan and blah 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 no you guys are truly out there helping people and when i asked for that help you guys were like in it 100 percent trying to help me get this marine back to the united states yeah so let's go there so you guys get <clears throat> afghanistan squared away i'm not squared away but you guys you guys do some <laughs> big work out there you guys yeah. you guys do big work out there now here we go into russia invades ukraine yeah. Right. And we think Mighty Oaks and Save Our Allies and everything are done. Yeah. And you guys aren't done. Right. Well, I'm not saying we think. I'm sure you guys know you guys are still doing things. But now Ukraine comes. What do you guys do when Ukraine comes? <laughs> yeah. So um, I knew I, I, I always watch what foreign militaries are doing. I was watching Russians build up on Ukrainian border. I was like, they're not going to do anything like. Yeah, it was always known that I just, just this is crazy. Like people are freaking out over yeah. nothing. Like and obviously in 2014 they annexed Crimea and, and they've been in like small conflict in yeah. the southeastern part of the country. But I was like, I don't think they're actually gonna do like some full scale legit invasion of Kiev. I yeah. was like, this probably isn't going to happen. And I was wrong. February twenty fourth, um, I was sitting in my apartment with my girlfriend at the time, um, Alex, who's now my wife, um, and I was like, holy cow, like Ukraine just got invaded. And it was almost like I saw on her face, she knew immediately that I was going to be going there. Yeah. And because at the, like when we first started, my wife and I's like dating to getting married was four months. And so, like, she knew what I was doing in Af with Afghanistan, and then Ukraine happens, and she's like, oh, crap. Like, this guy I just started dating who I love like, go again. is about to go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, But God blessed me with such an amazing woman that supports me That's awesome. in these types of things because she knows, like, God built me to do this stuff. And uh, so... Um, I call my dad and I'm like, hey, did you just see what happened in Kiev? And uh, my dad obviously watches Instagram like an old man. So he's got all of his new stuff yeah. on there. And he's like, oh, yeah, like I saw the Russians just invaded. So I'm watching on my phone live feed on Fox News of the Russians attacking Kiev. And I'm like, yeah. holy cow, like they're actually like in the city. It's no joke. Like modern warfare in kiev yeah and i was like i think we're gonna end up going to this i was like i have a feeling we're gonna actually do this well within 24 hours we had a team together um about to go into ukraine one of those team members sea spray yeah. um he was already in country at the time he is one of the most talented human beings at what he does on the entire planet and uh he 
called it and said it was going to happen within the next few days and sure enough it happened yeah and uh so we get this team together and uh i was supposed to leave within like four days but ended up having to push back like another four so i left eight day seven or eight days after the invasion um i fly to poland um at the time we started renting a house because we thought it was going to be like this long-term thing we were like we're going to be here for a while like yeah we don't know what this is going to look like so we're actually just going to yeah. get a house so we rented a house and uh we started like my my original job for going over here to help out was i was just going to help bring a bunch of equipment to you poland and then come back and forth i didn't know really what i was going to do yeah. and i didn't know what i wanted to do um I knew that there was a communications network that needed to be built within the country because the Russians attacked all the critical infrastructure within the first week. Um, and so I saw that there was a massive opportunity for that along with Sea Spray. And so him and I built out this communications network across the country um, that became very, very successful. And um, I would travel back and forth from Poland to multiple cities across the United States uh, to get this communications equipment. I traveled with so much equipment, millions of dollars worth of equipment across borders and never got stopped one time. Um, and I don't know how that happened. I don't know how, like, I was able to get across these borders without getting stopped. I wasn't doing anything yeah. illegal, but if I'm traveling with like sixty thousand dollars worth of batteries in a backpack, they're gonna be like, "Why are you? Why do you have sixty thousand dollars worth of batteries in a backpack?" Yeah. Well, because you won't let me check them on the dang plane because they're yeah. lithium. So, yeah. <laughs> um, like you know, just stuff like that. And so, um, it was a total god thing that I like was able to get all this equipment in and out across borders in Europe. Um, with no problems, nothing at all. And uh, I get all this equipment out there. I, I start creating these plans. I, I create the network across the country. I can see where certain people are with our equipment. And uh, I was like, wow, like this is awesome. Yeah. And then Ken, Kenny Isaacs comes into the room at our house. Kenny Isaacs is uh, one of the directors over at Samaritan's Purse for their international operations in Ukraine. And uh, I show Ken Isaacs what we have going, and he's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. We want to do this. So this basically idea that I, uh, that Sea Spray and I created, Samaritan's Purse took over. So it went from about 200 units to uh, over 2,500 units across the country. Yeah. And each unit is around 10 grand a piece. So you do the math. It's yeah. pretty expensive. It's expensive. Um, and all that stuff is is funded by private donors. And so we got this communications network built. Um, my dad and I are in the country, and we are, are like, getting our, our boots in the ground, getting comfortable there. Uh, my dad, obviously, like, is very busy with Mighty Oaks. Yeah. So my dad is flying back and forth from the United States to Poland, um, going to and speaking events in the U.S. and then coming back to Poland, going back to the U.S., coming back to Poland. Meanwhile, um, I'm going like across, back and forth across the border into Ukraine, uh, delivering these medical packages, delivering these communications packages. Um, and then uh, we get the call for Benjamin Hall. Benjamin Hall, uh, Fox News reporter, severely wounded uh, in a strike outside of Kiev. Well, our team... Um, was able to successfully get him. I'm not going to go into extreme. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't want to go into extreme details on it. I don't want to violate anything HIPAA or anything like that with him. But he was wounded really bad. Yeah. Um, and the way we did it was, um, I mean, very very crazy. Um, it wasn't running and gunning type of stuff. It was you know very smart people doing very crazy things to make sure that he got out of the city alive yeah. and brought back into Poland. And he was, and we rescued him. He is now able to go back home to his family. And uh, if it wasn't for Sea Spray, yeah, that guy would not be alive today. And, uh, you know. I think I heard this story of how you guys did it, and I was like, wow. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and Creative, so like I, I look at this and I'm like, how the heck did I go from being this like, you know, Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps doing the basic things I did in the Marine Corps to now I'm part of one of the most like sophisticated rescue operations that's ever happened for someone on the entire planet to the largest rescue operation for human souls like this is crazy like god what do you have in store for me like what what is this building up to because i felt like i felt like i was going to get that in afghanistan but i didn't like i got to do fun stuff over there but it wasn't like the 2011 2012 banging singing type of stuff it was like this moment in my life was like i could just feel it like the energy and so um my dad would slow or start to slow down uh, on on how much he would come to poland or go into ukraine and i was begging him i'm like dad like i want this position to to be in charge of mighty oaks international i want to lead everything here like i feel like it that's where god wants me in yeah. this season of my life and he's like he you know my dad he doesn't want to see his son get killed no and like in ukraine like there's a lot of americans dying over there and uh and my dad's like being re- like reluctant to it. Like he's like, no, I'm like you aren't. He wants you to be this man, but he's also still yeah. wants to protect you. He's like, I don't want you to do that. Like you're, you're not ready. And I'm like, dad, like I've literally been leading all this stuff. Like you say, I'm yeah. not ready, but so I'm like arguing with my dad. I'm like, just give me a freaking shot. Like yeah. let me do this. Like I need to have like the training wheels off. Yeah. Like I'm going so fast that the training wheels are shaking <laughs> off the bike. And so I'm like, you gotta let me do this. And he's like, fine. And so um, I do a trip in August of 2022. I'm back in September of 2022. And then I'm back in October of 2022. And uh, each one of these trips is like two and a half to three weeks long. So I'm home for like a week, go back to Ukraine for three weeks, come home for a week, go back to Ukraine for three weeks. Like I was there consistently. And, uh, you know, my wife is like literally my rock in all of this because we have a family and I'm doing all this with my family at home. Yeah. And I'm having to like literally um, give up my time with my children and my wife to go do these things. Yeah. And my wife was like, no, this is what God's calling you to do. Like, you need to go do this type of stuff. And I was like, all right, game on. Like, thank you. Yeah. And so it was, I was so happy to have that, that peace and confidence at home. And... Uh, September 29th, 2022, I'm in Ukraine, and uh, my dad uh, and me, we get into the country together. Um, I got Latham with me. Latham and I were in the Marine Corps together and went to Afghanistan together, just one of those close brothers of mine that I was talking about. Yeah. Um, had my buddy uh, Kyle with me, Marsoc Raider, team leader for Mighty Oaks for a few years, incredible man, uh, and then an Irish trauma surgeon with me. And uh, we were, my dad was supposed to go with us, but then there was a, an American casualty up in uh, Izum. Mm-hmm. And Izum is just, uh, it's on the eastern side of the country. At the time, the Russians were on, on it. Um, and it's about an hour and a half, two hours north of uh, Bakhmut. Yep. <clears throat> so my dad and Sea Spray go out for, for that, um, for something over there. And... Uh, my team and I, I lead my team into Bakhmut. And uh, at the time, I, I knew Bakhmut was like a very heavily contested area. The longest the, the city would go without any artillery or rockets hitting it was like 47 seconds for nine months yeah. straight. So it was like bad, bad. And I think for the viewers, if we can elaborate, Bakhmut is now under... Like, no, pretty, yeah, it's, it's completely it's, controlled, it's, it's by, controlled the by the Russians. Yeah. yeah. Go it's look at a picture yeah, of yeah. Bakhmut in 2021 and go look at a picture of present day Bakhmut. There's Scary. not a building standing. Yeah. So you go to Bakhmut. So, yeah, so I go to Bakhmut and uh, we stop at this gas station on the way in. I meet this old uh, Ukrainian dude and uh, he, he hears me talking and uh, he's like, oh, we got. America, Americanski's here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I started talking to him. I said, yeah, Americanski, like we, like just tell him like who we are. Yeah. Just we're humanitarian aid coming out here, helping out. 
and uh, the dude like broke down crying. I was filling up my Land Cruiser, and uh, he paid for my gas at this gas station. This was the last gas station before getting into like the the area of Bakhmut, like twenty minutes from the actual city. Yeah. At this gas station, you can hear bombs going off in the back, like probably like a few miles away. You just hear this the soft thud of it. Uh, you hear outgoing artillery, rockets, aircraft, helicopters. Like it was it was a war zone. Yeah. You know, all the soldiers walking around, they're like, it literally looks like World War One soldiers. Like these guys are chain smoking these cigarettes. And uh, so I'm like, all right, we, we take a picture with this guy. And uh, I was like, I might never see this guy again. I'm like, who knows? He might be killed today, tomorrow, next week, next month. I don't know. And uh, so we hop in the Land Cruiser and we're following these Ukrainians. And these Ukrainians are like, hey, we're gonna go into the city of Bakhmut, go across this bridge and go into this area where there's some Ukrainians that need some medical equipment. And so we get into uh, Bakhmut. As we're getting in, I'm like, dude, like this is, this is bad. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is no joke. Like, yeah. And so this is, uh, this is like the most wild experience uh, one of the most wild experiences I've had in Ukraine. So we get to uh, where we were supposed to cross, and it was a bridge that was sabotaged uh, by the Ukrainians that morning. Intelligence was not passed to the Ukrainians that we were with, and so we got stuck on an X. To our left, there was a shopping mall that was completely obliterated. Um, I mean, imagine concrete blocks the size of this room on the, like, on the ground because they were hit by multiple um, yeah. ballistic rockets, cruise missiles, all kinds of stuff. Uh, craters the size of uh, ponds. It was, you know, just insane. Well, the Ukrainians were, we were with, uh, they wanted to take photos at this bridge that was blown up. You know, they these guys were chaplains. So they don't get to, like, see combat, so they got their guns, and they're, like, taking cool pictures, like, you know, the PFC. Yeah. <laughs> um, trying to get cool yeah. stuff. And me, I'm like... I'm always, I like, whenever I'm in this area, like, I always think there's always someone or something trying to kill me. And if I was the person trying to kill me, what would I do? So I'm always constantly watching. I'm always constantly thinking, like, if something bad happens right now, what's my exfil route? How am I getting out of here? Like, I already have these things put into my head before I even get to the, get to this point, but, like, I'm constantly having to think. Um... And I start hearing artillery rounds. And the artillery rounds were like, boom. Like, you could feel the ground shake. And I'm like, okay, like, maybe there, because you hear small arms. Yeah. Maybe there's some guys fighting over here. And one of the guys um, got hit by yeah. a mortar. Or they launched mortar. Who knows? And so I'm like, all right, that's weird. Like, in artillery school, you're you're taught how to, like, measure the distance by the the sound yeah. of the explosion so i was trying to do that and i was kind of getting it but i wasn't i wasn't too hot at that and so i'm trying to find out the range and i hear another one boom this one's closer ground starts to shake a little more getting boom down. boom two in a row yeah. i'm like all right they're walking on us yeah and artillery you walk rounds yeah each round that hits adjust off that round yep being a forward observer guess what you do when you don't hit a target you walk those walk, rounds yep. and so they were walking those rounds on us and uh, they were getting so close that i was like if we don't get out of here we're They're going to you. die yeah. and uh on the other side of that bridge was a hill and on that hill is a perfect spot for observers snipers to hide and little did i know that that hill was the front line um at the time of the war that's where the Russians were. They were staged, ready to push into Bak, into the heart of Bakhmut, into the city. And so that literally shifted overnight. It wasn't there the night before when I looked. It wasn't there when we, it, it literally moved while we were on our way to that city. And uh, you never know any real live data until you get there and see it with your own eyes. Yeah. You can't, <clears throat> you can't trust it. Yeah. So, those rounds start coming in. Steve and I are outside of the truck along with uh, Kyle and our doc. And I was like, hey, guys, we need to get in the truck right now. Uh, this was um, 
one of the most surreal moments in my life because I was like, you know, I can be killed here right now and my daughter Charlie and my wife Alex are gonna live without me. And so I, I, I tell the boys to get in the truck. At the time, Steve was driving. And uh, I said, I'm driving Steve. He's like, all right. Steve used to be in charge of me in the Marine Corps. Now I'm in charge of him in the Eastern front of <laughs> Ukraine. And so um, S- Steve hops in the passenger seat and I said, hey guys, like, let's say a quick prayer. Um, Cause you know, there's one thing about having protection and there's another thing with having the protection from God that yep. is divine. And uh, so we stop, we all say a prayer and, and Steve Latham's mom, when we were in Afghanistan, used to send us these little, um, prayer books like these little books of just like a prayer for every day for a marine or a soldier and it was called psalm 91 and that actually made me start writing psalm 91 on the inside of my bicep every time i go on a combat operation in afghanistan or every time i'm in ukraine i have psalm 91 written on my bicep and uh you know we pray psalm 91 over our vehicle we ask for god to work in a miraculous way that glorifies him and that's the reason i'm here today is is to tell you how god saved our life because if it wasn't for God and his divine intervention and, and his grace, I wouldn't be here to tell you this story. So I get in the truck, say this prayer, and it's like, amen, and freaking book it. Like, I've never driven so fast through a city in my life. And uh, this, this trauma surgeon that we had with us, he was freaking out. This guy had never seen combat before, never been shot at. He's like almost crying. <laughs> Kyle's in the back like laughing because he's like this is why you need Jesus man yeah like th- like we've been preaching to you this whole time because at the time you know the doc yeah. that we brought with us he it's wasn't like, like part of the team yeah. he wasn't like um like this guy that is a Christian yeah. but we we're like we're this is a great opportunity for us to minister to a man that we get to serve with yeah. uh the gospel and so like we're driving out of this city I'm hauling butt I hear doc like freaking out in the back Kyle's like telling him to calm down, like telling him about God and stuff as like, we're like trying to get out of there so the artillery doesn't hit us. And right when we pop out the city, we have a round land right in front of us. And I'm like, oh man, like I thought we were gonna get out of this. Now they're following us. Yeah. And so uh, the Ukrainians in front of us were driving super slow. And I was like, look, they can die for their country, but I'm not dying for their country. <laughs> like, I love these guys. I love these Ukrainians, but if yeah. they're not gonna drive to survive, yeah. like. I will. Yeah. And so I pass them and uh, rounds are hitting in front of us, behind us, in front of us, behind us. So they're now bracketing on our vehicle while it's moving. It's not just artillery rounds, it's rockets hitting us. Um, but the most crazy thing about this, and I and I still to this day don't know like how this happened besides it being a miracle of God himself, every time one of those projectiles would land around our vehicle, the shrapnel, I would watch the explosion happen and the shrapnel would go in the complete opposite direction. Wow. And uh, I no mean, way. each one of each time a round would hit, I'd look at Steve and I'd be like, did you just see that? Like the house to the left of us, 10 feet away, just got obliterated and the shrapnel went in the complete opposite direction. Yeah. If you don't need a, like, if you need a better example of God's protection than that, and I don't know what don't else know you could ask for. Yeah. Like we were getting hit by artillery that's made to like destroy things. Yes. And I and you see the effects of artillery hitting things oh, yeah. and completely destroy stuff. Yeah. But we were getting bracketed on rounds hitting within ten feet of our vehicle, shrapnel flying in the opposite direction. We make it out of the city alive. Not a piece of shrapnel on our vehicle. Make it out of the city. The first step I take out of the vehicle, I almost step on a landmine. I almost first I almost drove over this landmine, and then I almost I step out and almost step on this landmine. Like God's protection was with us throughout that entire day, from the moment we enter that city to those artillery rounds coming in on us to exiting that city and getting bracketed on, and then to me almost stepping on that landmine. Oh. Like the amount of faith that I had at that point. I felt like I could step on water and walk across water because yeah. of the amount of faith I had. Especially being in an artillery background, you know those rounds should have hit you. Yeah, those rounds should have killed us, yeah. and uh, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, I look back at that and I'm like, God, 
Like you gave me, you gave me that experience to glorify you and how people should put their faith and trust in you and for protection, not in worldly things. Mm -hmm. The body armor I had on, the, the, or the plate carrier hat on, the high cut I had on, like my gaiters glasses, like none of that stuff would stop an no. artillery round from killing me. But he did. But he did. Yeah. And I'm here today to talk about that. And, uh, you know, if, if I can give any wisdom on that, it's like, what's holding you back from surrendering yeah. to that protection? Yeah. That's the type of protection that you get from Christ and yeah. nothing else. Like I, I've, been, I've been around, you know, aircraft that can strafe an entire village and you'd be safe. But what happens if that aircraft isn't there? Yeah. Guess who is there always is yeah. Christ. Yeah. And so you should have yeah. been dead on that road. Right? <laughs> I should have been dead on that road in Bakhmut, yeah. but you know, God spared me and my team. That's, that's and, heavy. uh, yeah. So I've had some other crazy stuff like that and you know, it, it's, I see stuff like that out there but you know it's like god called me to do that stuff so what we were doing as uh, we were delivering medical aid that's what our like original mission was um with the occasional rescue getting americans out um that either got wounded or killed um and then in january of 2023 um or february 2023 I realized that there was a massive need within the chaplain network within the country of Ukraine to um, help their soldiers who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. You know, a lot of the soldiers within the country, those guys are too busy fighting for Americans to come there and teach them about resiliency or introduce the gospel to them. Like you need some time with those guys and you don't want to rush it. And sometimes yeah. they only have like a few hours and you don't want to go there when they're having their time off and try to push the yeah. gospel down their throat they just wanted to take a break yeah they yeah. need to take a break like they're just mentally and physically yeah. exhausted and so um i saw the need for chaplains and um i with a few other guys and and uh some ukrainians we came together and said hey this is how we're going to do it we're going to start doing these three day long programs for ukrainian chaplains um certifying them as a mighty oaks yeah. chaplain right yeah uh, it's not like we're certified through some crazy school yeah. or anything it's like hey like this is what we feel like ukrainian soldiers are struggling with the most um from experiencing this with them on the front lines like this is our input to you as guys that have been to combat have been here in ukraine have served with your soldiers this is what we feel like we we should teach yeah and so we've served over um, 300 Ukrainian chaplains, volunteer chaplains within the country. That's and awesome. we've, we've come alongside of them and walked alongside of them and helping them teach their soldiers about resiliency and how to be a biblical warrior, yeah. right? Because uh, a lot of guys uh, say that it's not masculine to be a Christian. Well, guess what? Some of the most um, feared warriors on the planet are some of the best oh, yeah. pipe hitters like in our special yes. operations community are devout Christians. Yeah. Like they are not guys that are um, waving this flag that says Til Valhalla. No. That is the biggest load no. of garbage I've ever heard in my I life. I mean, you can go to Sean Ryan's show and just hear all those episodes. Yeah. And every single one of those guys, for the most part, has one thing in common, and that's God, right? Yeah. And you hear some of these stories, and they're huge, right? Yeah. And you're just like, whoa, like, wait. Obi-Wan Nairobi. You believe Christian in God, but you're like telling me all this stuff and a lot of people have that perception of like oh there's this hardcore killer dudes or whatever blah blah like how could they believe in god but no it's yeah. you know a lot of people don't think they take it for granted right yeah. they think you have to have this certain persona of who you are when you're following god and yeah. it's not that's not that's not the case right you all. can you can look like the scariest dude but as long as you're close to god and you live his way and you try your best to live his way it's it's insane like yeah. i mean I, if i look at you right now your tattoos and stuff you tell yeah. me you're a marine and stuff you tell me hey i you know i'm, I'm a big follower in christ i'm not gonna be like yeah come on you, you're yeah. full of crap <laughs> but some people will right yeah. they, they see it that way so yeah that's that's awesome and i think your story of ukraine is is a, a great testimony for people to also see that <clears throat> you have to because I know a lot of people might be like, oh, you know, you, so then you support the mass funding of Ukraine. So it's like, no, let's leave political stuff yeah. to the side. You were out there helping Ukrainians fight for their country. 
you can probably care less. I mean, I'm, we all care a little bit about all the funding that we're giving to Ukraine, right? But yeah. you're not there for that reason. You're there to help those people fight that war. Yeah. To not only now with communications and everything, but spiritually mentally because you know the repercussions of war right yeah. you know what's going to happen to some of these guys if they survive and they make it back to their their homes and their families they're going to live with something in here right mm -hmm. and from what we've seen just watching these video because i mean now it's like the TikTok war right you're seeing all these videos of war on TikTok. yeah it's crazy because it's just it, it wasn't like that before but no. now it is you see guys pleading for their lives when little drones are flying over them yeah i mean before we didn't have to worry about these dji drones coming after you now you you do and that's pretty scary, man. Yeah. You sit there and think about it. You're like a little drone is going to come just drop hell on you. Yeah. Right. And and you now helping these people find find a purpose. Yeah. And also find somebody that's going to be there to hug them and help them and guide them when they're when they're finished through all this madness. Because mm -hmm. it's you know everybody thinks you we're just giving all this money to Ukraine and you know whatever crazy political madness is happening is happening, but there's actual people dying for their country on the front yeah. lines. You know, they're whether they're receiving that aid we're sending them or not, they're dying for their country. They're they're going to war for their country. And I think you guys going out there and showing them that, yeah, whether our country's supporting them financially with billions of dollars, but we're also supporting them in other aspects. Yeah. And I've seen lots of Americans die out there. I've I've known of some personally that mm -hmm. have gone out and gotten killed in Ukraine yeah. to go fight. Not for the politics with what people yeah. think, but for because these people are fighting for their lives. Yeah. And I think what you guys are doing out there is amazing, man. Well, it it's says awesome. it, well, it says in the Bible, uh, go forth amongst the nations and make disciples amongst all nations. It doesn't say this nation or that nation. It says amongst all. Yeah. And biblically speaking, what we're doing is we put the politics aside because politics divide people. Yep. Um, I could care less. Yeah. And obviously, I, 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 I want my tax dollars to go to things in the United <laughs> yeah, States. No, yeah, yeah. Totally. Like, I disagree with a lot of the funding that goes to Ukraine. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that I feel that we as Christian believers in Christ have an obligation to give the gospel to men and women who are hurting. Yeah. And God has given us the ability to do that um, and the tools and the resources to make it happen. It's on our end to push the cart. And so... It's awesome, man. So Hunter, real quick, before yeah. we start wrapping this one up, Mighty Oaks Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you we, we just, we touched on it in the beginning, um, military, law enforcement, spouses, right? Um, now you guys are helping um, the people who helped us in Afghanistan, yeah. interpreters, all that good stuff. You guys are doing the international program. How do we, how do we get in contact with Mighty Oaks for any of the listeners right now that are like, Hey, you know, maybe that's something for me. Yeah. How do they get in touch with you guys? Yeah. So they go on our website, mightyoaksprograms.org. Okay. Uh, you can apply for our recovery program. So we have five locations across the U S. Um, we will fly you there. We have about 40 programs per year. Um, doesn't cost a dime to anyone. Like I said, again, um, if someone wants to donate, they can go in there and donate as well. Cause we run completely off and we'll put uh, these links funding. in the description as well so yeah yeah yeah, yeah so um if you want to come to our program you can go online apply applying is super easy it just it doesn't mean like it's you're applying for a job you just go on there so that we can get your information um get you plugged in have one of our um, program coordinators reach out to you within 24 hours usually it's within one hour um get you plugged in for a program get you scheduled get you all set up um, if you know someone that's struggling and know someone that needs to come through a program, get them to get them to sign sign up, awesome. sign up for them, awesome. make it happen. Um, if you know an Afghan SIV uh, that needs to come through our program, we also have the International Legacy Program. We awesome. call it the SIV program, kind of like the nickname. Yeah. Um, and that's completely free for them as well. So basically, they go on to mightyoaksprograms.org, go to the international tab, and apply for the SIV or International Legacy Program. Awesome. Um, that's completely free. You probably uh, will see us at a military base near you. Sounds like a commercial. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've spoken to uh, about 250,000 plus active duty troops across you, the really the world. Um, I think Speaking, your dad's doing like recon. Well, he's everywhere. He's, he's all yeah. over the place yeah. talking to these guys, right? Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Um, we speak to active duty troops on uh, spiritual or really resiliency, uh, the pillars of resiliency. Right. And so 
you know, it's inc it's incredible to to do the things that we get to do. Yeah. Um, we're very humbled to do it. Everybody that works for Mighty Oaks has a calling and a passion to do this. That's awesome. Um, if you are a combat veteran that feels like you can't connect with someone uh, that's a counselor, well, that's great because none of our instructors are counselors. Yeah. All of our instructors are guys that have went through combat, awesome. come through our program, went through our instructor training, and now we're giving back to our community. So it's very peer-to-peer -peer based. It's uh, awesome. it's very, very open. It's very honest. Um, we have some of the most incredible results out of any recovery program in the United States. We're, we're different than most. We're not gonna go in there and tell you all the things that you want to hear. We're not gonna make you feel like you're yeah. um, some Medal of Honor recipient. We're gonna, we're gonna bring you in there. We're gonna let you know that you're loved but we're gonna tell you the things that uh, that you're kind of messing up on in life right now, and that yeah. could be fixed. Yeah. And uh, that's our promise to you is that we're gonna be honest and transparent with you and show you the gospel. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Hunter, thank you very much, man. Yeah. I'm I, like I, super I, super uh, excited to put this out because I think it's gonna be huge for the listeners. Um, yeah. One because yeah, we could talk about Ukraine, we could talk about all this stuff, but you just you just showed. A lot of people what believing in god really is yeah man right um i can do all things to christ who strengthens me that's right yeah that's you know right. uh if yeah. it wasn't for god and it wasn't for for my wife and my family yeah. I, I wouldn't be here today that's awesome but yeah man this is a this is a shell off the eastern front for you um awesome. that's from a russian and so um i have a few of those and i give them out to to special friends and people i know but thanks man yeah that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely one. plaque this up with the, the <laughs> the whole deal from our first episode. I'll plaque it up, and I'm gonna actually I'll send you a plaque as well because cool, you're the first episode, man. And I thought this was, I have some other you know people that I want on here that we've been talking, but when I started thinking like what what direction am I trying to take this in, yeah. right? And I've been following my word of just talking to God and asking him what I wanted. And I was yeah. like, what better than to bring Hunter on and talk yeah. about these things. And your testimony is huge, man. Yeah, man. And I thank you for this. I appreciate it. Yeah, brother. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Well, Hunter, too many more. And hopefully we can uh, put this out and help some people, maybe yeah. save some more lives. And hopefully this to a, to a friendship on, man. Yeah. Have a good one. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Hunter. I appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome.